Hey folks, it's Jared Manninen from the website TahoeTrailGuide.com. Today I'm continuing on with my series of Introduction to Classic Cross Country Skiing. Before I get into today's lesson about weight transfer and glide, I'm going to do a slight recap of the previous two sessions that we talked about. I'll try to make it brief, but I do want to get people up to speed if this is the first time they're seeing this particular series of videos. So classic cross-country skis their geometry is long straight and skinny they have a pronounced arc to them which is called the camber of the ski that camber keeps the grip zone which in this case is a scale pattern off the snow so when we push off or when we want to move forward while running a classic cross-country ski we have to flatten the ski out completely so that those scales meet with the snow and give us a positive contact so that we can push off or move forward from that position that we were just in. And today we're going to be talking about transferring our weight from one ski to the other ski as well as what the glide phase looks like. Another point that I want to reiterate is that when we're classic cross-country skiing nearly the entire time we're going to be skiing on one ski at a time and this is most evident when we're actually diagonal striding which is the technique of which classic cross-country skiing is based on so the idea of compressing a ski flat so that we can get that grip zone to marry with the snow and allow us to push off requires all of our weight to be on one ski at a time and when we push off we want to have a slight drop in our center of mass and our body weight so that we can really flatten that ski to the max and then we're going to push off to the next ski and that push off naturally results in moving your weight from one ski to the next if we're doing it properly again by skiing on one ski at a time and that weight transfer is a complete 100 percent transfer of weight onto the other ski I've said it before, I'll say it multiple times, I'm sure, throughout all my videos that classic cross-country skiing is deceptively complex and at some level it's completely absurd as well because again, we're trying to stand on one ski while gliding over an uneven surface. This makes no sense until you start to develop your technique and understand how to apply that technique so that you can move fluidly and efficiently and effectively over snow. Like many of my videos, I'm going to throw in some mini demonstrations of me diagonal striding. Keep in mind that these particular demos don't necessarily correspond exactly to what I'm saying, but it just gives you a look as to what diagonal striding looks like. And in this video, I provide a couple of different angles. So I've included some profile shots of me going from left to right in front of the camera, as well as away from and toward the camera, and a couple going off to different angles. I also want to take this time to apologize for the amount of wind that ends up blowing in randomly during this video. I recommend turning on the closed captions if you find it difficult to hear me. Just a couple of quick notes before I start showing some of the demonstration segments of this particular video. I just wanted to make some comments about the actual training conditions on which I'm skiing today. And as you can see, I'm in the off track and back country uh, setting. We haven't had any fresh snow in quite a while. So what we have here today is a pretty crusty top layer of about an inch or two on top of sugary unconsolidated snow. So you'll notice as I'm showing some of these demonstrations that I look like I'm going kind of slow. That's because I am. The point I'm trying to make is that part of cross-country skiing is reading the terrain, it's reading the snow and feeling what's appropriate. In this soft kind of collapsing situation, I can't afford to really jam down hard or really press the ski down super hard into the snow because I'll just bury it. So I have to be a little bit softer because of that snow is softer when I compress the ski to push off. So that's one reason why you see it looks like I'm just kind of cruising along at a 
medium pace here and that's that's why if it was a firm surface i could apply way more pressure and i would actually need to apply way more pressure just because it takes more effort to compress the ski on that firm snow or rather it takes more effort to get those scales to touch the snow which is to say to compress the ski on soft conditions you don't have to compress the ski nearly as much just because you're meeting the snow or you're marrying with the snow so much quicker because the way the camber is just gently squishing into that softer snow you can get the grip that you need even though that's a little bit outside of today's lesson regarding weight transfer and glide phase I'd be remiss for not acknowledging that and again reiterating the fact that nothing operates in a vacuum here so if I was at a groomed resort where the snow was firm I could demonstrate what the technique would look in that environment but I'm off track and it's the same technique it just looks a little bit different and this is one thing that I like about talking about cross-country skiing is there's endless opportunity for discussion and there's endless things that we can always be working on and fine-tuning as we ski so just being aware that different snow conditions calls for different application of technique and in this case a little bit less pressure to push off gets you a step ahead of the game as far as having a better time skiing with more efficiency and effectiveness. I realize that it may sound a little bit arrogant for me to say that by sharing my love of classic cross-country skiing that I feel like I'm preserving a dying language, but you'd be surprised at how many times I get complimented on my technique at a groomed resort. And it's mostly because a lot of the long-time skiers who know how to classic cross-country ski have nearly exclusively gone to skate skiing. So on any given day at a ski resort, you may or may not see a whole lot of people who actually implement good technical diagonal striding technique. Again, this is why I like to incorporate some of these little mini demos into my videos just so that you can get it into your mind what it could look like for you. Again, pushing off, all of our weight is on one ski and we're transferring all of that weight onto that second ski. And once we do transfer that weight onto the second ski, now we're gonna glide on that second ski until we reach a point where there's diminishing returns on that glide phase, meaning there's no point in gliding until you come to a complete stop before pushing off again. That'll take some time for you to develop your tempo and your rhythm when you're diagonal striding, but you'll know when you've glided too far. It'll feel like you're just holding this kind of stylized posture the whole time and there's too much uh, pause in between pushing off. Or if you're doing it too fast where there's no glide phase and all, that's the other end of the spectrum as far as how much glide is too much glide, how much glide is not enough glide. That's something that you're going to work on and it's going to also be directly based on the quality of snow, the wax job you have on your skis, whether or not you even get glide. Um, in theory though, you're going to get glide, right, if you're doing the technique properly. So all of our weight on one ski and nothing is isolated from one another. That's why I'm kind of combining the weight transfer and the glide phase because it's not that there's not enough information to talk about each one of those phases separately. It's simply that they're so connected that it's easier for me to just talk about them at the same time. So going back to the push off phase where all of our weight is on one ski, a lot of times it ends up looking like this to people when you're balanced on one ski. Technically I'm balanced, I'm not falling over, right? But this is not an effective or functional posture from which to do anything else from other than just stand here, right? My hips are kind of up, my shoulders are uh, down. It's got these weird angles to it and my knees are collapsed inwards. This is not good. So. To correct this, let's think of a string maybe pulling our hip out to the side and then let's try to maintain this neutral posture with our shoulders and hips parallel to the ground and now our center line is nearly perfectly over our foot. So this is kind of the 
challenging part when it comes to balancing on one ski and gliding over it is maintaining that posture so that you're not in an awkward or unstable position and as a result struggling the whole time because you move from one unstable position to another better to understand what it looks like to be in that aligned posture from the get-go so that you can keep working toward that same aligned posture from one ski to the next and this is kind of the key thing about that 100 percent weight transfer is you need to know what it looks like to have 100 percent of your weight on one ski at a time I always think after the fact, while watching these little demonstrations of myself skiing, that I probably should have worn much more form-fitting outfits so that you can see the alignment of my legs, for example. But uh, yeah, I don't always like to wear the tight, stretchy pants. So these are some nice trekking pants that work great for this off-track and backcountry experience. They actually are made of some stretchier material, so they're pretty ideal for cross-country skiing. That said, as I'm watching myself ski here, it's nice to see that there's actually space between my knees. This kind of indicates to me that I've made some progress in getting my knees to align more properly as I'm bearing weight on each ski independently. If you look at some of my older videos, you'll see I look totally knock-kneed in, in various shots that I'm skiing toward the camera. Another thing that I notice and try to pay attention to when I'm filming myself either going to or away from the camera is whether or not I'm doing what's called tenting with my ski poles. And tenting is basically where you bring your hands in a little bit too close to your center line, causing the ski poles to angle outward. It's better if you can keep them in the same linear plane, so having a little bit wider hand placement and you don't necessarily want your ski poles up and down, but you want them in the same direction. And it's very similar to running. Generally speaking, it's not ideal to let your arms swing across your center line because that causes your upper body to rotate. And that's inefficient movement when you're trying to do this long distance thing. It's better to let your arms hinge at the shoulders and then let those ski poles just naturally swing in this one plane. It keeps your upper body much more relaxed and free of excessive movement. Let's take a, another quick look at what that alignment looks like when we're getting ready to transfer our weight, which means we're beginning to push off and that's going to be a flat ski on the ground our ankles are flexed slightly our knees are flexed slightly our hips are over shifted a couple of inches off center from our whole body right let's think of it this way um, we have two legs we're standing in this neutral posture my feet are hip width apart and let me remove one of my feet from the equation it's going to naturally cause me to fall over, right? I'm a table with two legs and I'm taking away one leg. So the natural response, if we uh, keep alignment in mind, that is, is to shift our weight laterally just so that our weight can still be on one leg. Um, for some people that may end up looking like that, that kind of leaning contorted position but let's get away from that let's try to eliminate that image from our mind and let's just stand there with both of our legs out let's remove one leg and let's just shift our weight and when I say shift our weight let's go ahead and bring that hip out just a couple of inches so that our feet our ankle our knees our hips our center line are in alignment our shoulders are parallel to the ground or in this neutral posture as well as our hips so this is what we want to embrace to look like to strive for when we're moving from one ski to the next in the push-off phase and everything starts to come undone when you start to gain a little bit of momentum and speed so it's something you have to constantly monitor and that's one of the reasons in my selfish ways of 
videotaping myself skiing is that I get to do all kinds of movement analysis on my own posture so I can constantly be tweaking and correcting that because I've traditionally had a really bad uh, habit of letting the knees collapse in and I can still stay balanced like this and sort of have squared shoulders this front panel being uniform but now my knee is in there and I'm really jetting my hips out I want to be have this kind of tall um, elevated position yet still having some flex in the ankles and the knees and just by shifting that hip over so there's all kinds of ways that we can like fool ourselves into believing that we're balanced and stable but those are the things that we have to internally fix. There's nothing that any coach, any instructor, any person on YouTube can ever tell you to do that will make you change. You have to make that change within yourself, right? We're talking in metaphors anyway. Um, one of the things though that I have started to embrace is the fact that my ankles and knees are independent from one another so I can angle my feet a little bit more so that I'm not using my whole uh, leg to keep a flat ski, for example. I have traditionally walked a little bit bow-legged, or at least the outside edges of my heels, they're always turned. So my idea originally when I was trying to develop a flat ski was to bring my whole leg to get it to roll flat. And now I'm really trying to work independently those joints so that my feet are flat, my knees are still aligned, my hips are, are aligned with my center line. So this is a challenge and it's not something that comes easily, especially when you add some gliding into it. But once you develop this posture, this, this starting position when we push off, because I always consider the push off phase to be the starting point for all of this diagonal striding movement, you'll be much more quicker on the uptake when it comes to learning diagonal striding uh, better. The only cross country ski race that I've participated in, well, to date anyway, was the 2019 Great Ski Race that travels from Tahoe City to Truckee, California. And this is on the North Shore of Lake Tahoe. The race is a mixed race. There's no differentiating between skate skiers and classic skiers, but anyone who's competitive and wants a chance at winning that race is definitely on skate skis. That said, I was only competing with myself. I wanted to push myself and see how well I would do. And I believe I did pretty good. I actually think I was the first classic skier in because nobody passed me after I passed all the other classic skiers. I finished with a total time of 2 hours and 48 minutes, which is a respectable time, especially considering I was on waxless cross-country skis, so the scale pattern type. And the course is an interesting one because it's 7 miles of uphill and then about 11 miles of downhill and flat-ish type terrain. The looks of confusion and somewhat disbelief on skate skiers as I passed them going uphill was rewarding in and of itself. But ultimately, I'm sure the vast majority of those skate skiers that I passed going uphill blew past me on the downhill because it's much faster to go downhill on skate skis than it is classic skis, particularly the type I was running, which are those waxless skis with a scale pattern. At the time, my fitness was high, but my technique wasn't as good as it is now, particularly my downhilling technique, so maybe I could have gotten a better time. And perhaps I'll once again participate in that race but now I'm a couple years older, and who knows if I'll be in quite as good a shape. So when we're in that compressed ski state, just prior to pushing off, we're in this aligned posture, and when we do push off, there is gonna be a slight rotation of our hips, and then as we transfer our weight, we're driving our knee forward and that helps to create momentum. At the same time, we're swinging our opposite hand forward as well. So this should be a timed event. So I'm pushing off with my right ski, my left hand is forward, my hips rotate slightly back and then I drive the knee forward and my hand comes forward at the same time. And this is a pretty, I don't know, advanced complex kind of a thing, this hip rotation. What I don't like to see is people trying to exaggerate, like really doing a twist 
uh, when they first start learning. So let it come naturally. Don't overemphasize that hip rotation, but there is a slight rotation of the hips. And the idea of transferring our weight to that other ski, start to embrace driving the knee forward rather than the foot. Uh, what tends to happen if you're straight legged, well, what tends to happen if you're thinking more about landing the ski rather than driving the knee is that you'll land the ski soon, you'll land the ski too soon, and it'll start to slap. Um, there's a bunch of different things going on in this situation if you find yourself slapping your skis, but a lot of times it's because you're landing your ski too soon, and a way in which to correct that is to think more in terms of driving the knee forward. So when we're landing, we're landing on a slightly flexed ankle and knee rather than straight leg. We don't ever really want to be straight legged when we're diagonal striding. It's just not a good look and it doesn't lend itself to effective technique. So we're in this aligned posture. We just compress the ski. We're driving our knee forward, swinging our hands forward. And I'm landing. I like to emphasize landing on the front half of the foot. Ball of the foot, sure, you could say that. I just say on the front half. Let's try not to land on a flat, uh, flat foot. Land on a flat ski, not a flat foot. And I know that sounds a little bit uh, contrary or contradictory, but the fact of the matter is, is where we're, our body, where our feet are placed over the grip zone, the front half of our foot has more to do with compressing a flat ski than it does the whole foot. It's more that front half of the foot on the grip zone or right on top of the camber. So think of that. And again, you know, it's not running. Diagonal striding is not running, but it's also not unlike it. So if you think of how you land your feet when you sprint versus how you land your feet when you run long distance, that's the difference. Let's think of more in terms of sprinting where we're always on the front half of our foot. I do want to apologize again for those random gusts of wind that well up in this particular video. So thanks so much for sticking it out thus far, and I hope it hasn't been too distracting. But that's the nature of nature sometimes. I'm sure it's pretty obvious that I'm not quite as snappy and zippy as I am in some of the other videos where I'm on that firm snow condition. And again, that's just a part of the overall cross-country skiing experience. You have to adapt your technique to the environment in which you're skiing. And for me to try to stop abruptly in this particular quality of snow where there's that one to two inch layer of crust on top of unconsolidated sugary snow has the potential of being unforgiving. Let's put it that way. As we're transferring our weight, keep in mind that idea I just mentioned about having our hip slightly shifted to the outside so that our weight is perfectly aligned and balanced on one ski. That means we're gonna have to shift it slightly lateral as well once we transfer that weight to the next ski. Now, the problem with thinking about this too much is that you end up with the, the weeble wobble effect of people going down the trail like that. Um, it's only a few inches side to side. It shouldn't be a huge movement. And again, another nuanced and kind of complex element of this diagonal stride equation. Just know that that has to happen in order for you to move in an aligned position from one ski to the next. And yeah, the tracks are, are pretty linear, but there's obviously a space in it, right? And again, if we think of that idea of being in this neutral posture and removing one leg, it stands to reason that once we move one leg, we need to shift our hips slightly. Just try not to emphasize this too much so that you're, you know, sashaying down the uh, trail or whatever. Just a couple of inches in either direction just so that you're lined up on each ski. Driving forward. And then just maintaining this posture in the glide phase for a split second. Again, 
that's going to be up to you to decide how much is too much glide or how much is not enough glide and the terrain will dictate that if you're going up an incline this steep there's not going to be a whole lot of glide going on if you're on a flat you can draw it out you know a foot or whatever it's all free distance i guess you could say and i'll just demonstrate a couple of dry steps so aligned on my right ski my left hand is out in front i'm gonna drive my knee forward and i'm gonna swing my hand mostly from the shoulder that right shoulder that is and i'm just gonna pause there for a second so that i can glide so i can simulate that glide phase now my left ski is gliding right hand is forward and i'm gonna go ahead and drive my right knee and swing my left hand forward and I'm going to pause just for a second to simulate the glide phase. And that's kind of it, you know, in a nutshell. There's so many nuances and details that you can perpetually be working on. And there's all kinds of micro adjustments that are occurring in your feet to maintain that stability. One of the things that I love best about living at Lake Tahoe is I have all these small little areas in which I can go on cross-country ski relatively conveniently. This being one of them here at Grass Lake, it's on top of Luther Pass, which is essentially the standard for cross-country skiing on the south shore of Lake Tahoe because it is so accessible and flat. But it's a great place that I can practice training at because it's a little bit higher elevation. So there's usually snow here when there's not snow at my house, which is lower on the mountain. I know today's lesson was supposed to be more about the weight transfer and the glide phase, but I can't emphasize enough of getting that correct posture down for the push-off phase because that is the starting point and everything builds from there. If you go from one poor uh, posture, you're just gonna go to another bad posture. So get the posture correct when you're in your push-off phase and know what that feels like, even if you're just standing there statically like I am right now. Uh, flexed ankle, flexed knee, flexed hip, but still maintaining this upright feel, this tall feel about me. I don't wanna be you know, hunched down or anything like that. It just should be this kind of natural, buoyant feel to it, yet still having uh, neutral shoulders, neutral hips. And once you get that feeling, particularly when you get comfortable on both sides, right? Uh, the weight transfer should be relatively natural from that point because you're just moving from one position to the next. The key is to know what that next position looks like and lo and behold, it looks like the position you just came from, just the other side of your body. So there's a lot of subtle stuff, a lot of nuances in there and you're not gonna get it all out on your first day on skis, that's for sure but it's something to work toward. Um, I'm actually getting a little bit chilly, so I think I'm gonna close this out. I think that's enough for today, more than enough probably. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or feedback, post it in the comment section below. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, and then check out tahotrailguide.com. Take care, everyone.